Lecture 17. This will be the introduction to evolution. Uh, there will be three lectures, um, 17, 18, and 19, that will uh, go along with Module 12. Module 12 is our last module of the semester, and they all have to do, all of these lectures have to do with evolution uh, and different uh, aspects of it. But tonight, uh, this, will, this lecture will be talking about uh, the introduction of evolution. So this is the time where I would ask the class, what do you think evolution is? Uh, there are a lot of ideas, large ideas, large concepts uh, that are out there um, that aren't necessarily evolution itself, but are built off of the idea of evolution. And some of those ideas are uh, the origin of life, uh, so how uh, how the first cell or first cells were created from macromolecules and then began life as we know it on the planet. Or um, where human beings come from. Uh, the fact that we share ancestors with uh, other primates that are found on Earth. Um, the tree of life itself, uh, which is seen down here. Uh, so how all organisms are related to one another. Um, fossils and um, dinosaurs and, and all of these ideas. So yes, uh, these ideas are out there because we understand what evolution is. Um, they're built off of the idea of evolution. But evolution itself is a more simple idea. Evolution is the genetic change of a population over time. Uh, and this is seen in every species that we know of on Earth. Um, evolution occurs when there are changes in heritable traits from generation to generation. Some lead to the development of different species. And so uh, when we think of the, uh, the small micro evolution of generation to generation, this is what we saw when we looked at genetics, uh, how uh, the P the P generation uh, created the F1, created the F2, and as those generations went on, uh, the different alleles, the frequencies of those alleles changed through time. And this would be a microevolution. Uh, with the new species forming, uh, this is considered a macroevolution. This is a larger scale uh, evolution, and it takes a lot of time for that to happen. Small changes uh, over a large period of time will create these enormous changes, uh, enormous to us. The process of evolution helps explain the present and past features of all organisms, from microbes to humans. So using evolution, uh, we try to understand how certain uh, morphological features uh, have arrived in a particular organism. We look at the organisms they may have um, come from, they may have evolved from, and what features they had and how those features may have evolved. Uh, and so this is how evolution has kind of helped us understand the history of our planet, the history of organisms. But each one of these characters that are being uh, helped explain, um, we can easily be wrong. Um, biologists make mistakes scientists make mistakes all the time. It doesn't mean just because certain things have been wrong in the past that the evolution, the idea of evolution is wrong. Uh, evolution, again, is this base idea, this core idea, this somewhat simple of an idea that populations, the genetics in the, these populations are changing over time, which again is seen over and over in every population that we know of. So I alluded to uh, this slide earlier in my the first slide explaining uh, micro and macro evolution. Uh, so different types of evolution. Um, the first we'll talk about is microevolution. This is the small changes of a single population over time. Usually this is a smaller time frame. We're looking at, you know, it could happen in a single generation. It could happen over uh, a few, several generations. Uh, but we're looking at small changes. 
macro evolution are large changes over a long period of time. So it is um, macro evolution is the building of the micro evolution. So with micro evolution over hundreds of thousands of years, you can have this large change that is seen in the fossil record, this macro evolution. And macro evolution, yes, it is still built off of changes in populations, but over over thousands of years, over millions of years, these populations are constantly changing. Um, they're um, coming together, getting smaller, getting larger. Uh, as bigger changes are happening, different changes are happening with these populations. So yes, it's still building on the idea of populations, but it's hard to keep track of populations themselves over this amount of time. Um, and these large changes can result in a new species. And we'll see how that is in the last lecture that we have, um, looking at speciation. So population genetics is not a type of evolution, but again, it's, it's, um, it's a field of biology. It's a study of biology uh, that's basically looking at natural selection and how it affects population through changes in allele frequency. So genetic population, uh, or I'm sorry, population genetics is um, a subset of biology. So looking at this idea of allele frequencies and, and kind of figuring out uh, what this is, uh, evolution does not work on individuals. Uh, individuals already have their alleles. Um, so when you're born, your genes already exist. Uh, and so evolution is not going to change uh, your alleles, your genes. They're already set into place. Um, but if the next generation that comes out, they will be altered by evolution. And we'll look at how that might be, um, which individuals of the population will be mating, um, why they will be mating, uh, are there certain features, certain genes and alleles that are giving them an edge uh, to mate more often type of thing. Uh, and so in a population, allele frequencies uh, will change from one generation to the next over time. Um, so allele frequencies are basically how often uh, the ratio that that allele is in the population. Um, some alleles become more common in a particular population where others can be less common over time. And this is the evolution, the change of that genetic makeup over time. Allele frequencies vary between population. Uh, and so if we think of human populations around the world and how they are morphologically different, uh, physically different from one another. Uh, in the population of, in, in an Asian population, uh, the frequency of alleles that produce black hair would be much higher uh, than if we were to look at the alleles of, let's say, the population of Sweden, um, Switzerland, um, some, some sort of um, uh, European population. And so, an allele frequency is calculated by the following, um, the number of copies of an allele divided by the total number of alleles for that same gene in a population. Uh, on the next slide, I'll actually work through uh, this, this calculation. It's a very simple calculation, uh, but it might be confusing uh, when just looking at those, those words and terms. So calculating allele frequency, this, uh, I, I popped up the, the same calculation that was on the last page. So let's look here when we're coming up with, with this. Um, let's figure out how we can uh, look at the total number of alleles for the same gene in a population. So let's say there are 50 individuals in a population. This is a very small population, but it's easy for this calculation. Each individual has two copies of each gene or two alleles, whether they're the same allele whether they're different allele, um, they have, each individual has two copies of each gene. So that means there are a total of 100 alleles out there. 
50 individuals, each having two alleles. So that means there is a total of 100. So this bottom portion of the calculation is 100 for this example. Well, we need to know what each individual has allele-wise. Uh, we can't do this just by looking at uh, the color of their hair or uh, the color of the fur or um, color of eyes and things like this because as we know from the genetics lecture, if an individual is heterozygous, then you don't know if they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous in those alleles. So you have to literally know what alleles they have. Um, and so that's a very difficult question to answer uh, in, in the real world. But in the just figuring out this, this calculation, we won't get into that. So let's say our population is the following. Um, there are 50 individuals, as we see on the bottom. Uh, and so when you, you know, look at the 35, 10, and uh, 5 individuals, uh, that equals 50. And so these are the genotypes of these individuals. Um, and with that, we can calculate uh, these frequencies. Um, so we want to know the amount of each allele. In each allele, here is the big H and little h. In order to figure out the number of big H alleles we have, you take the homozygous dominant and you double it because we've got 35 of this H and 35 of this H. So that's a total of 70. Uh, but then you also have the heterozygous. So there are 10 individuals that are heterozygous. So you have the 70 plus this 10. Uh, so there are 80 total big H's out there. See how I get this? The 35 doubled plus the 10. Uh, in order to come out with your small h, there are 10 individuals that are heterozygous, so 10 small h's. And then there are 5 homozygous recessive, so there are 5 of this h, 5 of this h. So 5 plus 5 uh, plus the 10 equals a total of 20 of those. Uh, and so then once you figure out this, these numbers, then it's a quick, um, you divide each of them by 100 to get to get your allele frequency. So with big H on this example is a uh, 0.8 um, frequency or 80% of the population uh, has, or 80% of the alleles are big H in this population. With the small h, 20% of the alleles in the population are a small h. And so these numbers can be very different uh, depending on your population, but this is how you would calculate it. Uh, so evolution um, is detectable by examining the gene pools. And so what we had just looked at uh, in the last slide uh, was the gene pool of a particular population uh, looking at one particular allele. Uh, and in this example, uh, the population in Sweden, the frequency of alleles that produce uh, black hair are very low in comparison to uh, the population of, a, of an Asian population uh, where the, um, the black hair alleles are very high. So this means uh, the gene pool for the population of Sweden is different from the gene pool of an Asian population. So if we looked at the numbers of uh, the allele frequency of the big H and little h uh, for these populations, those percentages, those numbers would be very different from one another. When looking at this particular gene, if you were to look at another gene, they might be the exact same across the board. It all depends on what gene you're looking at. Um, if Swedish population, uh, if, if a group of Swedish people were to migrate to Asia uh, and um, interbreed, have babies uh, with the local people, uh, then the allele frequencies of this gene pool will change. Uh, so we've got new individuals coming into the population, bringing new genes 
um, new alleles uh, mating for the next generation, then that next generation is going to have uh, different frequencies um, and different gene pool, uh, and evolution has occurred. Uh, it doesn't need to just have new individuals come into a population for the gene pool to change. There are lots of other reasons that gene pools can change. Um, the last like 10 slides uh, are showing uh, of this lecture will show various reasons why um, populations or gene pools uh, can change. So over time, uh, there was lots of different uh, ideas and theories that contributed to what we now know of as evolution. Um, some were totally uh, incorrect. Well, not totally, but some of them were wildly incorrect, uh, while some of them were uh, pretty right on from early. Uh, and so I won't, uh, I, I won't kind of... Uh, grade you on all of these individuals, uh, but there are two ideas that are our take home here. Uh, the first is written at the top, um, uniformitarianism. Uh, and so uniformitarianism is kind of an idea uh, that changes in nature uh, will happen gradually, will happen slowly. Uh, and so uh, these populations will change on a constant, slow basis in order for the change to happen that we see over uh, macroevolution. Uh, another idea is this catastrophism. Uh, and so this is um, brief, violent events uh, that make big changes. Um, so a meteor hits the earth and changes the environment of the, the surface of the planet um, in a short amount of time and these changes, these evolutionary changes happen in bursts, um, which in reality um, both of these are happening um, over time. Unif uniformitarianism, these gradual changes are happening um, at a constant uh, constant rate-ish. Uh, they're, they're happening slowly throughout time. Uh, but then these events, these large catastrophe events, are going to uh, have large jumps in evolutionary changes. Uh, so both are happening. And this is seen in the fossil record. Um, we will, in our next lecture, we'll talk about um, the evidence of evolution and um, when looking at fossils. Uh, this is a big part of the, the ev um, evidence for, for uh, evolution, uh, some of the first evidence of evolution that humans had. Uh, so fossils provide evidence for changes over time, both gradual and rapid changes. Um, when looking at fossils, uh, this idea of, uh, of superposition comes into play. Um, so the older rock layers are going to be the ones that are lower uh, in the sediment. The, the, the higher rock layers, the rock layers that are more um, in this picture, uh, these rock layers up here are going to be younger than the rock layers that are below. It makes sense, right? You have to uh, have a foundation before you build on top of. Uh, and so these rock layers below are much older than these rock layers above. And so if you were to find fossils in these rock layers, then you know that these fossils are older than the rock than the fossils that are found uh, higher up. And so the, the hypothesis here, um, fossils of extinct species in old rock layers uh, suggest that the living organisms or the organisms that are higher up have evolved from the common ancestors of um, the species below. Uh, and so if there are only so many organisms on the planet, the ones that come after uh, have been evolved or have come from the previous um, species.
So the father of natural selection, the father of evolution, uh, is uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin. I'm sure most of you have heard the name. Um, we're going to talk about his studies, his voyage, um, his ideas, and how um, he helped form uh, what we think of as evolution today. Uh, so Charles Darwin um, voyaged around the world. Um, back then, uh, ships would go around the world um, doing different things, um, uh, studying the coastline, um, taking goods from one part of the country to the other, or sorry, one part of the world to the other. On most of these ships, there would be a naturalist. Uh, the naturalist would uh, collect items, uh, organisms, fossils, things that they find around the earth, and then they would bring them back to London and put those, um, what they found in a museum and different, and sell them, different things like this. Um, Charles Darwin was the naturalist on the SS Beagle, uh, and this was uh, in the late mid um, 1800s. Uh, where he traveled around the world and um, collected uh, collected things as a naturalist. Charles Darwin documented uh, the great variety of organisms in South America and their relations, uh, relationships to fossils and geology. He began to think that these were clues to how new species originated. Uh, and so this, you know, new species originated, it kind of touches on uh, his famous paper, his famous book, uh, The Origin of Species, um, which if you've ever heard of it, great. If not, um, it's a tough read. Uh, it's um, older English, uh, but, um, but it's very, very interesting. So through Darwin's observations, uh, he proposed the idea of descent with modification. He is very famous uh, for studying the organisms on the Galapagos Islands. Uh, the Galapagos Islands are off the, off the west coast of uh, northern South America. Uh, and uh, it's an archipelago of islands with lots of different organisms. Uh, each island kind of has its unique habitats, uh, and each habitat... Uh, each island uh, gives rise to specific um, specific species. Uh, if you know anything about uh, Galapagos Islands, you know that the, the habitats range um, greatly. Uh, there are lots of different types of habitats on these islands. It's, it's something I would definitely love to go visit for myself. Um, uh, he's famous for looking at uh, the finches on these islands, the Darwin finches. Um, he had, he saw that the, the finch, the finch beaks, um, would match up with the type of food that were found on these islands. Uh, he thought that maybe the different finch species all descended from the same finch ancestor, uh, and then had, um, descended, uh, from that same ancestor with modifications that allowed them to live on these particular islands with particular food types. There is a picture here um, showing uh, a finch with a large, larger beak, smaller beak. Uh, these can have to do with maybe the size seed uh, that they're eating. Uh, a larger beak can enable you to uh, crush a larger seed. Um, if the beak was thinner, um, and pointed, it might enable you to be able to eat insects better than uh, seeds. And so these different morphological features um, were matching up with what was found on the island. If the island had plants on it with larger seeds, well, those finches on that island were able to eat those seeds. Whereas if there was an island without that particular plant and there were plants with smaller seeds, then you would find finches with the smaller beaks, and, and so on. Through this idea of descent with modification, uh, Darwin proposed the idea of natural selection. Um, Charles Darwin saw 
that the environment of each island influenced the survival and reproduction uh, of the finches living on the islands. Finches with features best suited for that environment were able to survive and reproduce better than others. So the idea of the finches with larger beaks uh, were able to eat the larger seeds. Um, if you had a beak that was not able to eat a uh, particular food that's on the island, you might go hungry, you might not live very long, you might not produce as much offspring. If you're not producing offspring, then your genes are not going into the next generation's gene pool. Uh, your genes are lost. And so if that happens with all the individuals with, let's say, smaller beaks, well then the next generation, on average, will have a larger beak. And after generation and after generation and after generation, uh, these beak sizes will change um, significantly if they're being pushed in a certain direction. So with natural selection, the idea is that uh, the selecting force uh, will be nature on the reproductive sex success of these individuals. So the environmental factors will cause the reproductive success of individuals with particular genotypes. Um, so if you have a population uh, with a variety of uh, genotypes um, and in that environment there are certain uh, factors that are better for certain genotypes, certain um, phenotypes, because uh, really a, a, a genotype is, is, is thought of which of these alleles are being expressed, um, and the particular allele that is being expressed that is better for that environment will have better reproductive success, will live longer, will be able to um, share their genes, their alleles, more often. In this slide, we will look at some of Darwin's observations and then the inferences that came from those observations when creating this idea of natural selection. So we had discussed the majority of this, uh, but it, it, this, puts, this puts an actual label on, on the different observations that he, he made. So observations in nature, um, there is a genetic variation among the individuals in a population. All individuals will be different from one another. Now, Darwin didn't know uh, that this was genetic variation, that there was uh, a difference in genes and DNA. He didn't know about DNA, but he did know that there was morphological differences uh, among the individuals. Um, in nature, there are limited resources. Uh, so every habitat contains a limited supply of resources required for the survival of that individual or that population. Resources could be food. Resources could be um, a shelter, somewhere to live um, and, and get out of the elements. Uh, they could be uh, mates. Um, there could be a, a limited resource of, of mates. Um, there's an overproduction of offspring. So more individuals are born than will survive to reproduce. Uh, and this is the case, you know, um, every population has, most populations have um, issues with predators, issues with um, possible sicknesses, uh, illnesses, uh, different things like this. Um, so the inferences that come from these observations, there is a struggle for existence. Individuals need to compete for the limited resources that enable them to survive. They need to compete. The first one to get the food is going to be the one to eat it, uh, and the others will not be able to. Uh, or the first one to get to a particular shelter, uh, if uh, it cannot be bullied out of that shelter, then, um, then the individuals without that shelter will not have it. Um, so there is an unequal reproductive success. Um, this is natural selection. 
the inherited characteristics of individuals uh, make them more likely to obtain resources, survive, and reproduce. So the individuals that are best suited for that environment, they're able to get the food better than the other individuals. They're able to live in this environment uh, in some sort of a better way than the other individuals of that population will have better reproductive success. Uh, if you're living longer, you're living healthier, you're going to be able to mate more. You're going to be able to pass on your genes to the next generation more. And then this brings the idea of descent with modification. Uh, so over many generations, the population's characteristics can change by natural selection, uh, giving rise, possibly giving rise to a new species, uh, but definitely giving rise to new characteristics in that population. And so the idea is uh, when the environment is the factors of an, of an environment um, will be influencing the characteristics of that population, the genes, the alleles of that population to go in the direction of better survival. The ones that are not able to survive will die. Uh, they will not carry, their genes will not carry on to the next generation. So this modification uh, is the alleles that were out there uh, when new alleles pop up, new mutations, uh, if those are beneficial, well then they will be selected for um, by nature more. Condition, conditions necessary for evolution via natural selection to occur for a specific trait. Uh, so this is kind of summing up um, that list of, of ideas. Um, so variation. Individuals in a population must differ in some way uh, for a specific trait, and, and we see this with populations, um, genetic differences. Um, even in cases where uh, we're talking about a species that is going to um, uh, reproduce asexually, uh, there still are some differences amongst the, the individuals of the population uh, because of mutations and things like that. But yes, uh, these populations are much more similar uh, individual-wise than, uh, than a population that reproduces sexually. Um, there will be some sort of a, a difference in fitness um, amongst the population. So uh, variant traits must result in better or worse survival reproduction. So when we're looking at the particular trait uh, that we're going to be talking about. So the, the beak size or the beak shape and size of our finches um, has a has the ability to change the reproductive and survival rate of these individuals. Um, if it were, you know, there are many genes and traits that might not uh, differ that much because of a particular environmental situations. Um, so we're looking here at, at the traits, specific traits. Uh, and then inheritance uh, traits must be passed on through uh, success uh, to the next generation. And so all of these things are taking place uh, in populations and this is how natural selection will be influencing evolution. So what is this fitness, this uh, survival of the fittest? Um, fitness is basically the reproductive success that an individual has. Um, this is, you know, simply defined here, uh, but uh, when we think of the fitness of an individual, there's actually mathematical calculations that are done um, looking at for every for every offspring that that individual uh, has, uh, if it's a sexual reproduction, uh, then it is Point, it, a point 0.5 is added to its fitness uh, because half of the genes of that um, of that individual has passed on to its offspring. For every, let's say, grandchild that that individual has, there is a point 0.25 added to their fitness. 
Um, there's also cases where you can add for if the, um, so my sister has 50%, roughly 50% of my, gen my same genes. If my sister has an offspring, well then 25% of those offsprings uh, are my genes. And so it's, it behooves me to help the survival of my nieces and nephews because they share my genes. So this, this idea of fitness, simply put, um, is reproductive success. Uh, but there are calculations that can go into um, fitness and uh, why maybe individuals will uh, behave certain ways um, because of, of helping their fitness. So fitness, organisms, genetic contribution to the next generation. They need to survive in order to reproduce and then have offspring uh, that will survive to reproduce. And this is how uh, an individual can increase its fitness, uh, share its, gen its genes to the future, to live on through its genetic material. Uh, and, you know, even if an organism has a, only lives for a certain amount of time on the planet, um, they can still have good fitness. Um, if generations last a day, um, it doesn't matter if it's, um, you know, 25 years to the next generation or 25 minutes. Uh, it just matters that the uh, organism is able to survive long enough to pass on its genes to the next generation. And then hopefully that next generation will continue um, on and on. Uh, when we think of natural selection, it is nature that is kind of influencing uh, which traits and which alleles uh, are best suited. Uh, when we think of artificial selection, humans are doing the selection. Um, and this happens a lot uh, when it comes to domesticated animals, domesticated uh, plants. Um, we are artificially selecting. Uh, we are... Uh, altering the allele frequencies to what suits us best. Uh, in artificial selection, a human chooses for the desired features, uh, then allows only individuals that share those features to mate with one another uh, in order to get a generation with a more desirable trait that we are looking for. Um, Dog species, or I'm sorry, dog breeds are a perfect example of this. When we think of all the dog breeds that are out there, from Pug to a Great Dane to German Shepherds to Chihuahuas, all of these individuals are the same species. Uh, they've, over the years, they have been artificially selected for certain traits uh, to make them look the way they do, look the way they do, act the way they do, uh, different things like this. Um, so think of, you know, think of all the different breeds of dogs and how, just how strong this selection can be. The differences between these individuals are, can be really great. Um, so not only, you know, not only dogs are a good example, um, but uh, we do this with uh, other animals. We do this with plants. Um, on the right-hand side, we have several vegetables uh, that are all the same species. Um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, cabbage. They are all the same species. They come from this wild mustard plant. Uh, and so just like breeds of dogs, all of these plants, all of these vegetables have been artificially selected for certain features. Uh, and uh, now we have these different breeds that we can eat. Uh, but ultimately, they are the same species. Uh, so artificial selection uh, or selective breeding helped Darwin with the theory of evolution. So you know, these plants and these animals have been artificially selected way before 
Darwin's uh, existence. And so he saw how humans were doing this and kind of put two and two together how nature is doing this same thing. Uh, there are a lot of supportive data out there uh, that kind of um, helps to understand the evolutionary theory. Uh, over years, large bodies of, of research have co uh, come together uh, to help Darwin um, come up with his ideas, and then and then afterwards, um, more more data, more research has kind of backed up his ideas. Um, we will talk about. We'll talk about um, these, you know, isotopes, radio, radioactive isotoping, um, certain fossils for age, how Pangea has come into effect, uh, looking at phylogenetic trees. Um, we've uh, talked about DNA already, but we'll, we'll look at how um, the code of DNA can help create these phylogenetic trees. Um, so a lot of these we'll kind of touch on uh, individually, uh, most in the next lecture. So natural selection helps mold evolution. Um, natural selection is not uh, the same thing as evolution. Um, evolution, again, is the genetic change of a population. And there are different reasons that the genes of a population can change. Natural selection is just one way uh, that is going to help push evolution into certain directions. Uh, certain environmental conditions will push evolution into a certain direction. So natural selection is one way, one, um, one way that evolution can work. Um, so we have an example here of a seahorse uh, seen on the right hand side and it see how it uh, camouflages very well into the environment around it. So each generation the best camouflaged individuals are going to be the ones that survive to reproduce. If you are not camouflaged well, a predator will be able to see you and pick you off. Uh, and then when you have been eaten, you cannot pass your alleles to the next generation. So the alleles for the individuals that survive uh, will be the alleles for the best camouflage of their generation passing on to the next generation and becoming more and more common as the generations go on. And so this is how natural selection is selecting for the best camouflage of this population. If the environment around these seahorses change, um, the, uh, the camouflage would change. So if, if the, the coral around it went to a different color, a different species showed up, um, and the colors changed. Well, then the camouflage would need to, would, would go into a different direction. Um, but the take-home message here is natural selection does not create these camouflage alleles. Uh, it is just working with what already exists. Uh, natural selection strongly selects for the camouflage alleles uh, that arise by chance, and they arise by chance through mutation. Um, and so if the environment around changed to a green color, but there was no allele uh, for a greenish camouflage, well then green wouldn't pop up on the seahorses um, because there is no allele for it. It's only if there was a mutation or a allele that already exists for a certain color, um, that's the only way that that population is going to then go in that direction, be naturally selected for. Uh, natural selection only works with the alleles that exist, um, not creating new ones. Natural selection operates on the variation present in a particular population. Since more individuals are born than resources can support, the struggle to survive is inevitable. Some individuals in a population are better than others at surviving and reproducing. Uh, and so that could be for many different reasons, uh, many different traits. 
uh, the, the, uh, the heritable traits conferring these advantages are called adaptions. Uh, features that provide, adaptions are the, the features that provide uh, a selective advantage uh, because they improve the organism's ability to survive and reproduce. So adaptions, every environment uh, has its own adaptions um, and these are features that allow these individuals to survive better in that particular environment. Um, and so, you know, the uh, uh, organisms that live in the Arctic, their adaptions are, uh, they have white fur. Um, the, the white color allows them to match their surroundings of the snow. Uh, they've got thick fur because uh, they need to stay warm and that is an advantage that helps them survive in the Arctic whereas you take these same individuals and put them in a different environment they might hardcore stand out uh, you take a white fox and you put it in a jungle well then they're gonna stand out immensely and get picked off by predators we have seen these slides these next two slides in, in the first lecture that we had um, looking at the characteristics of life uh, but this comes back into play here looking at um, how bacteria change uh, through uh, the use of antibiotics so how natural selection is is um, molding evolution and so bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics have an adaptive trait that non-resistant bacteria lack. When antibiotics are administered, resistant bacteria are strongly selected for. So in the beginning, you've got, um, you've got all of this bacteria, uh, and over time, you'll have a mutation pop up. Uh, this mutation, uh, represented by the red, uh, is a, it's a mutation that allows them to survive um, a particular antibiotic. If the antibiotic is present, then they can live through that antibiotic. It won't kill them. In a world without that antibiotic, there's no reason for it to be selected for. And so that mutation will stay small. Uh, the frequency will be small in that population because there's no need for that frequency to get higher. Once the uh, once the antibiotic is administered to this population, well then all of these ones that are susceptible, the green ones, will die, the red one will survive, and then uh, reproduce more and more and more, and you'll have a population that looks like this, where most are uh, resistant to that antibiotic. Well, this is an example if the antibiotic was not present, uh, and so it would remain the same or very similar too. And this is um, just kind of ex explaining so the antibiotics um, cannot create a resistance allele. That resistance allele has to exist in the population already uh, for it to become more and more, the frequency to be higher. The variation in resistance was already present in the population. The presence of the antibiotics caused the resistance allele frequency to shift higher and this is seen all the time uh, with um, uh, with antibiotic resistance so evolution does not stop uh, you can have a population that is perfectly adapted uh, for the environment that they live in but environments are always changing and so um, so does evolution uh, so does the alleles in that population. They're constantly shifting due to the environmental conditions. Uh, as, as these environmental conditions change, the phenotypes that natural selection favors will also change. Adaptions seem perfect uh, for one particular environment at one particular time, uh, but they can change. Um, they could become not perfect as time goes on, or if uh, in another new environment, they are completely wrong for that one. Um, so with evolution taking place in different populations, um, this means that the allele frequencies are changing in these populations. And so 
the hypothesis would be that the allele frequencies are changing in, in, in a particular population. And in order to have uh, this hypothesis, uh, scientists need to test it against a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis here uh, is that allele frequencies are not changing. And so uh, we'll be looking at um, the, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which is basically a situation where frequencies are not changing over time. And it's basically used to, uh, to compare um, to if changes are taking place. Um, and so um, in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, uh, it is unlikely, uh, this is an unlikely situation uh, where allele frequencies are not changing between generations. Uh, it is a useful tool to use when other factors are unknown. And so um, the next couple slides, we'll, we'll get a little deeper into it. Um, you pretty much need to know the fact that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium uh, is a null hypothesis here. Uh, it's a way of comparing um, changes that are happening and seeing why changes are happening. Um, and uh, there are assumptions when it comes to the Heidi Weinberg, Hardy Weinberg that we'll get into in the next couple slides. So in order, in order for the Heidi, Hardy Weinberg equilibrium to occur, um, certain assumptions need to be met. Uh, natural selection cannot be taking place on this population. No mutations can be popping up, creating new genes, new alleles. The population has to be large enough to eliminate any random changes in the allele frequencies. Individuals must mate at random, and there's no immigration or emigration uh, from this population to the one next to them. Uh, so they're not intermingling with another population. So as you can see, these assumptions are uh, very far-fetched. There are no populations that meet uh, all of these. Now, there are some populations uh, that will meet some of these, um, but no, no population will meet all of these. Uh, and so, again, the reason for this Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is to, to to look at how um, certain features can come into play and change things up uh, in different ways and things like this. It uh, helps biologists understand what is going on in the world around them. In the world, there are lots of different variables. And so this equilibrium uh, concept, you can look at each variable and figure out how it's changing um, the allele frequencies without looking at all of the variables at once. Uh, if you only have one independent variable, uh, it's a lot easier to understand how that's um, affecting things than if you have multiple independent variables. So yes, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibri equilibrium is a useful model. Uh, but it is not real. Um, populations do not meet these assumptions. Um, most populations will violate uh, the different assumptions. Uh, and so natural selection and mutations are occurring all the time in different populations. Uh, random changes in allele frequencies are common um, where you know individuals randomly die um, or, or situations like that. Uh, most populations do not mate randomly. Um, there are some, but uh, most populations uh, do not mate randomly. Uh, and there is usually always some level of migration uh, between populations. Uh, so natural selection can shape populations in different ways. Uh, we'll talk about three different modes of natural selection. Uh, directional, disruptive, and stabilizing. Um, each example is seen on the right-hand side, and I'll talk about uh, each of them individually. Um, they are distinguished by their effects on the phenotypes in the population. 
Directional selection favors for one phenotype over another. And this example uh, is a classic uh, from the industrial age in, in England. Um, so this particular moth uh, lived uh, on the tree bark. Uh, so hiding in the tree bark, there was dark trees and light trees, uh, light colored trees, so a whiter uh, kind of a, like a cedar color trees. Uh, and um, when the industrial age came through, uh, humans were putting a lot of soot into the environment, uh, into the sky, and then it was coming down onto the trees. So the white colored trees were becoming darker, uh, and the light colored moths that would hide against those particular trees were now standing out um, very, uh, very easily to predators and predators would pick them off uh, and we had a directional shift in the population of this moth where uh, it was seen like this where the phenotype was kind of 50 50 dark and white well when the soot started landing on the trees we got this directional shift um, and the light colored uh, phenotype um, frequency went way down uh, and the dark went up and that was because of this environmental uh, condition. The black moths survived uh, and reproduced more than the light colored moths. So this directional shift to a dark colored phenotype. Uh, a disruptive uh, selection favors extreme phenotypes. So in this case we're looking at snails where uh, the snail population um, the uh, the phenotypes are kind of um, mostly uh, medium sized um, oh, I'm sorry color wise mostly this um, this medium color between light and dark uh, well a shift taking place where a predator is able to uh, see the medium color more uh, but the light color and dark color are able to hide better uh, then we have this uh, shift here um, where it's been disrupted. And so you have the medium population, um, this medium phenotype of the population uh, getting picked off and eaten, uh, but the light color and dark color are not. They're able to camouflage. And so this is this disruptive where the extreme phenotypes are favored. Um, very light color, very dark color snails survive and reproduce more than the intermediate color does. Stabilizing selection uh, favors the intermediate phenotype. So it's the opposite of this disruptive selection. Uh, so stabilizing selection takes place with human babies. Um, the medium size human babies are much better at survival through childhood than the smaller and larger uh, individuals. And so uh, with that being said, then the, uh, the medium size phenotype is selected for uh, and kind of narrows and narrows. Uh, the medium sized babies survive and reproduce more than the very large or very small babies. And so we've got this intermediate that's being selected for. Natural selection can shape populations in many ways. Uh, some harmful alleles persist in the population due to a heterozygote advantage. So if you think about an allele uh, that's detrimental, that's going to kill individuals, well then why would it stay in the population? Well, there could be some advantage. In this case, we're talking about a heterozygote advantage, uh, where the heterozygote, the big H, little h, um, actually has a positive uh, effect um, and that can be seen when it comes to sickle cell anemia. Uh, so when it comes to um, so when it comes to the alleles that cause sickle cell anemia, sickle cell is the shape of the red blood cells and so um, big D, big D represents um, normal size or normal shape uh, of our red blood cells, these circular spherical red blood cells. Um, 
they represent the healthy form of our red blood cells doing what blood red blood cells need to do moving through our bloodstream and and giving oxygen and taking away carbon dioxide well they also are susceptible to malaria malaria is a protozoan disease that comes from mosquitoes um, and malaria mostly uh, seen in, in Africa but it's also seen in Southeast Asia uh, and um, uh, South America uh, but uh, Africa is is one of the areas that's hit hardest with malaria and so the big D big D normal red blood cells are susceptible to malaria but they're functional and healthy blood cells um, little d little d is the sickle cell uh, red blood cells so sickle cell is this like half moon shape um, it's it's a gene that causes the red blood cells to be this half moon shape as blood is going through our bloodstream uh, through our veins and arteries uh, if they have this sickle shape to them they kind of um, they bump into one another and kind of uh, catch on the things and they don't flow as well there are lots of issues that come with sickle cell anemia uh, it is a painful disease and there's a lot of negatives uh, that, that go with this so why would this persist in the environment uh, in the population well if you are heterozygote if you've got big d little d uh, there is some reason that you have uh, a lower your lower susceptibility to malaria uh, so because of the the big d you have round blood cells but you also are not susceptible to malaria and so uh, this heterozygote for sickle cell anemia uh, do not have the disease uh, but they are protected against malaria. If two heterozygote males, if two heterozygote uh, parents mate, their children have the possibility of, of causing the sickle cell anemia. So this heterozygote uh, situation is the advantage. And that is why this uh, still persists as high as it does uh, in, uh, in, in certain populations. Uh, lots of African populations um, have large amounts of sickle cell anemia um, in them. And that's because this is also where the uh, malaria is present. And so individuals with uh, lower susceptibility to malaria are able to survive and pass on their genes. Sexual selection uh, is a part of natural selection uh, that is going to directly influence reproductive success. Sexual selection are basically uh, traits and behaviors uh, that allow um, the competing with one another to, uh, to choose a mate or certain characteristics that the other sex is going to uh, choose uh, which one they want based on the the certain traits that they have. Um, for a while, uh, sexual selection kind of perplexed biologists. Uh, it seemed to be counterintuitive uh, compared to natural selection. Uh, so if you think about it, um, building a complex nest um, to attract a mate. So this, um, this complex nest is going to take a lot of time uh, to build, a lot of energy when you could be out there uh, mating with others or you could be eating and kind of um, getting healthier but instead they're spending all this time building this complex nest um, showy colorful plumage uh, so certain some birds will have very colorful uh, very colorful feathers or long feathers coming off their tail both of these uh, make them very susceptible to predators um, these these uh, colorful Feathers make them show up to, compared to their background. They don't camouflage as, as, as well. Uh, the long feathers of a peacock uh, make them slow flyers. Um, butting heads uh, with these rams. Um, so when they're competing with one another to get a mate, um, 
this behavior can be detrimental. Uh, they can interlock their their antlers and their horns and ultimately die because um, because of this behavior. So this, you know, how can natural selection allow for these traits uh, when it's obviously reducing their survival? It, it seems to go against. Um, so we'll see in the next couple slides how sexual se sexual selection uh, is a type of natural selection uh, resulting from the variation of the ability to obtain mates. In some populations, there's a fierce competition for mating. Uh, intrasexual selection occurs when the stronger individuals in a population battle to win access to mates. The weaker individuals are denied access. And so you can see this as an environmental condition. The environmental condition is you are surrounded by uh, other individuals in the population competing for uh, a mate. And so uh, the individuals that, are, uh, that have these adaptions, that have the, uh, these features, these traits that are the strongest, the best, are going to be the ones that are able to mate. Uh, and so, um, so those are the features that are selected for um, through this sexual selection. In some populations, individuals choose the best mates. So instead of fighting uh, to get a mate, um, a certain sex will sit back and choose which one they want. Usually it's, it's a she. Uh, the, the female will sit back and choose uh, which male uh, she wants to mate with. Um, and this is intersexual selection, uh, occurs when members of one sex chooses mates that um, with the highest quality features. And so with this situation, um, we have individuals with characteristics that go against what you would think normal um, survival traits would be. Uh, so these long feathers, these colorful feathers, um, actually reduce your ability to survive. But from the female standpoint, she can see the individuals with the most colorful feathers, the longest feathers. If they're able to survive with these characteristics that reduce their survival, then that means they must be so healthy and so strong that they can overcome these features um, that are detrimental to their survival. And so she's choosing uh, individuals that have the ability to survive and overcome these features. Um, there are certain uh, characteristics, or there are certain sexual traits that um, you know, they dance, uh, so they, they're showing off their ability to, uh, to dance the longest, uh, the strongest, to, they can leap the highest, um, frogs can croak the loudest. These kind of features, these traits are showing that they are stronger, that they're able to do these things better than the other individuals, and so they must be healthier. Their sperm must have... Uh, the genes for better offspring, and so that's why the females are choosing them. Sexual selection causes evolution to occur. These individuals with the sexually selected traits uh, mate the most, um, and therefore they pass along their genes the most. Uh, this mating is not random, and so this violates this whole individual's mating randomly uh, assumption of the hardy Weinberg. Now, if you've ever heard the term runaway selection, uh, there are individuals that, um, there are cases in history um, where some of these sexually selected traits um, become so outrageous that individuals cannot continue surviving. So um, there is the Irish elk. Um, now, it is thought that the Irish elk might have, uh, populations went down because of, of humans um, hunting them. But another thought is that their antlers 
became so large uh, due to due to sexual selection, they were selected for the, the females um, wanted to mate with the males with the largest antlers. These antlers became uh, so large over time that they started to get tangled up in the forests of Ireland. Uh, and um, they were not able to, um, to live in these habitats as easily. Uh, and it's thought that their populations um, died off because of this runaway selection. Uh, so the next couple slides, we're going to look at uh, charts like this, um, showing how the frequencies change over time. And so uh, this is uh, looking at sexual selection, um, how it influences reproductive success. And so this over here, um, you know, this is a pie graph showing the number of uh, the alleles that are present, so the frequency here. Uh, and then you can see, you know, these dots are representing the number of individuals with these alleles. And so before sexual selection takes place, we've got, you know, we've, we've got a pretty diverse population allele-wise. Well, if individuals have, uh, certain individuals, this color blue, uh, these individuals have more opportunities to mate, so they've got traits that are either selected for or um, they can overpower uh, the other mates, the other individuals, or the females find it uh, appealing, um, then the population will change like this, and you'll have that allele uh, become a much more dominant frequency, uh, a much higher frequency uh, will be seen. And so uh, this is showing that the this particular genotype phenotype uh, is becoming is favored and becoming more common in the population, whereas the others are becoming lower. Uh, evolution can occur in other ways, uh, and so these same kind of graphs uh, are are showing um, these different ways. So. Mutations. Uh, so in this case, uh, we've got a population, that same population we saw before, with the allele frequency kind of being uh, somewhat, somewhat um, uh, normal spread, uh, like a, an, an average spread. Uh, but then one of these dark blues uh, mutates and becomes this yellow. And so over time, if that yellow uh, is beneficial, you can see it becoming more prevalent in the population. Even though it's small, it's still seen. It now is a new number, uh, a new allele seen in the population that's going to be taking away from the frequencies of the others. So this gen new genetic variation appears in the population. Genetic drift. Um, so in this case, there's lots of alleles that we're seeing. Um, all kind of uh, somewhat normal spread, normal ratio here. Uh, and then some event takes place where, uh, by chance, these alleles are lost. Now, this could be um, that a landslide takes place and kills a chunk of the population and just randomly these alleles are all lost. Uh, it, um, let's say, for whatever reason, if these alleles uh, were kind of um, in this corner more, the landslide takes place and kills all of these individuals, and for whatever reason, these alleles are lost in the population. Well, as time goes on, those alleles will not go to the new generation, and so you'll see, um, you'll see a much different frequency happening here. Um, now, I guess I was saying that these were completely lost, uh, but it, it looks like they weren't completely lost. There still were a little bit um, some individuals that have uh, those alleles, uh, but those alleles uh, didn't come back as quickly. And so the new population forms um, with the alleles that are remaining. And so this is genetic drift. And there are a couple examples of genetic drift that we'll go over. 
Uh, so mutations cause evolution to occur. Uh, mutations create genetic diversity. Mutations are random changes to the sequence of DNA. They can be harmful, uh, but many are harmless, uh, and some are beneficial. And so, again, these mutations are a change to the genetic code. Um, this could be a point mutation where um, one, uh, one is added, or I'm sorry, one is changed. Um, or it could be a frame shift mutation here, where the frame shift mutation is actually more detrimental, um, completely changing uh, down, um, downstream uh, all of the codons. Beneficial mutations are passed on to the next generation, uh, and they will change the frequency. Uh, their frequencies can increase. Uh, if they are harmful, most likely they will not uh, stay in the in the gene pool unless for some reason there there's um, something that that causes that to stay. Um, genetic drift. Um, so again, this is kind of the the idea of uh, randomly randomly taking out um, alleles from a population. So if we think of we think of the population as being this jar of marbles, um, this, this jar of marbles here. And so um, for whatever reason, um, so we've got, we've got 100 marbles in here, uh, but only 10 individuals are going to um, move on to the next generation, to, to have offspring in the next generation. So if you randomly chose 10, it's not necessary not necessarily that you're going to choose five yeah uh, five yellow and five blue in this case it was seven and three well you just randomly selected uh, that uh, your random selection and that random selection like I, I was saying could be landslides could be uh, a hurricane comes through and um, certain individuals drown um, it just happens to be that some individuals were in an area of higher ground and they randomly survived. So that's what these, these picks are. Uh, and so, so that random pick here, um, you've got now, uh, instead of a 50-50 ratio, you now have a 70-30 ratio. Well, let's say that happens again. Um, that, that random uh, selection happens again. And so this time, um, nine yellows were chosen and one blue. So now you've got a 90% 90, 90 and 10%. Uh, if that happens again, the, 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 fact, the chance of this 10, this blue getting chosen, is less. Uh, and so you could have these individuals, um, these blue individuals, those alleles being totally taken out of the population because of random events. Now, this was a lot of random events happening in a row um, perfectly to get the situation, but it does happen. Um, genetic drift is random sampling error. Uh, allele frequencies can shift dramatically and often become eliminated when only part of the population survives to reproduce. So we'll go over some real-world examples of how that happens. Uh, genetic drift, genetic drift, random change in allele frequencies over time. So the key here is random, um, and it can eliminate alleles, reducing diversity. Uh, fixation, uh, only one type of allele for a trait within a population. So if there used to be two or more alleles and then some are lost, now there's only one allele. Uh, this fixation has occurred. All, individu all individuals will be homozygous, whether it's dominant or recessive, they'll be homozygous, and genetic diversity will be lost. Now, this fixation is kind of how we create uh, breeds, uh, artificial selection of breeds of dogs and, and, and plants, um, but this can also happen um, ran through random events in nature where um, diversity is lost. Um, one way that this can take place is called uh, is through the founder effect. Um, 
when only a few individuals establish a new population. Uh, and so um, they're showing uh, an Amish an Amish population here. Uh, so in in America, when people were coming over, um, the Amish came over, um, kind of making settlements in Pennsylvania and New England. Uh, and so these settlements kind of stayed to themselves. Um, they only mated with other Amish people. They didn't, um, any individual that mated outside of the Amish kind of um, didn't stay in the Amish group. So the Amish are a big um, example of this founder effect. Uh, you've got a select number of individuals. So if this were, if this were the population of Amish in... Europe, only a small, only a small portion came to America. So this small portion only brought the alleles with them that they had. They did not have the diverse alleles that all of Europe had, uh, and so they only brought what they had. And so there was a genetic loss, uh, genetic diversity lost um, in this new population of America. And so um, this is the founder effect. They have lost diversity because they founded this new population. Uh, and um, the Amish are an interesting example because they only, um, they only interbreed with each other. And so uh, there are lots of different um, situations uh, that occur in the Amish population that don't occur elsewhere. Um, lots of uh, homozygous uh, diseases and things like that are seen because of um, different founder effect, uh, of different founder effects happening. So this is um, a human population doing this, but you can also have, uh, let's say, um, a uh, a drought takes place and opens up a new pathway to cross uh, a sea that wasn't normally there. Um, a small number of, let's say, wolves pass into this new land that they weren't be there before, and then the drought goes away, fills up with water, and so only a few of these wolves are now in this new area. And so they have, uh, they're a founder uh, population into this new area, uh, but they did not bring all of the diversity of genetics uh, that the larger population had. And so this is this founder effect. Um, another example of genetic drift is bottlenecking. And so a population can bottleneck uh, uh, after a disaster uh, drastically reduces the size of a population. And so when we look at cheetahs, um, cheetahs, the population, this random killing of cheetahs is taking place by human hunters. Um, so humans are out hunting cheetahs and their populations are um, strongly reduced. Now, we say that humans are randomly uh, killing the cheetahs. That's debatable, um, but you know, if a cheetah is seen, they're being shot and killed and and um, or hunted, um, and that is what is causing this this um, this bottlenecking. And so, you have a diverse population, but uh, lots are being killed at random, and so what is remaining is only a few, and so those few are mating and causing uh, a genetic loss, uh, the genetic diversity is lost here. Um, kind of like the founder effect, but instead of founding a new area, uh, your the, the population is just being dramatically lost. Uh, another factor that can cause uh, evolution is uh, through gene flow. So this is through uh, migration, whether it's um, immigrating in my um, emigrating out um, and so if you've got uh, this diverse population here uh, and many of a particular allele is um, emigrating emigrating out um, then it can change the population um, the frequency of what remains so if lots of these yellows and blues leave for whatever reason um, 
they're taking their genes with them and leaving the population without those genes, which could change the frequency. Um, and so if we look at, uh, we have a population here um, of light-colored rabbits, a population of dark-colored rabbits. For whatever reason, this one individual uh, leaves this population and goes to this population. It's going to change the gene pool of this new population. Um, the gene flow moves the alleles from one population to the other. Uh, and then if you want to look at some more examples of uh, natural selection, uh, you can you can go to web. Um, these are kind of interesting, this whole dilemma that humans had, biologists had, um, sexual selection versus uh, natural selection. Um, these are kind of interesting. Um,